Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Good morning, everyone. I'm Margaret Warner. Welcome to day two of the Council's Edward R. Murrow 60th Anniversary Fellowship Celebration. Um, I had the honor of serving on the fellowship uh, selection committee this year, and we're delighted that so many of you, including so many former fellows, are joining us for this special event to celebrate both the work of the last 60 years, but also point the way forward and how we do sustain vital international coverage in the digital age. Uh, we have three panels wrestling with that issue today from various points of view, and we hope you can stay for all of them, including our luncheon, lunch luncheon session with uh, several network uh, presidents. We're also pleased that today Edward R. Murrow's son, Casey, is with us. Casey, are you here? Well, good to have you. Good to have you. Um, also, as Richard said last night, there's a special thanks due to the Ford Foundation. Uh, Ford this year generously provided funding both to sustain the fellowship going forward and to support this event. And Time Warner responded to Ford's $50,000 challenge grant to make this conference possible, and we're also most grateful to their support. Now, on a personal note, I'm, I'd like to add that the Ford Foundation is one of the three funders for the NewsHour's Overseas Reporting Unit, which I, which I head. And so I know firsthand Ford's commitment to, to sustaining international coverage. And so it's a special pleasure to ask Calvin Sims, who's Program Officer at the Ford Foundation and a former Murrow Fellow himself from his days at the New York Times, to say a few words before we begin. Thank you, uh, Margaret. I'm sort of wearing two hats this morning. Um, one is a funder of, uh, of media uh, projects to improve the quality of journalism through Ford, and two as a Murrow Fellow. And so um, when Camille uh, called uh, the Ford Foundation to um, inquire as to whether or not we'd be interested in sponsoring um, something like this, um, this Murrow Fellowship, it seemed a no-brainer on both fronts. Um, we at Ford um, provide funding for a variety of efforts to improve the quality of foreign reporting abroad because we believe that good foreign policy um, can only start with good information about foreign affairs. Um, for me, I began my Murrow Fellowship here at the Council eight years ago. It was right in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, I had been a correspondent for the New York Times in, um, in South America, and then I was in Japan, and then I was in, in uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia. It had been a particularly difficult two years in Indonesia, and I was in need of some sort of respite to kind of gauge all that had happened. And uh, I applied for this fellowship and got it. I arrived here on September 10th uh, from, uh, from Jakarta, and then the next day the world changed. Um, there was a moment when I decided I wanted to run down to 43rd Street on September 11th and be a part of that reporting um, in the aftermath. But I realized that if I went to 43rd Street, I could never complete the Merle Fellow because they would never let me go. I would have been tied uh, to the Times for at least the next year or so. So I decided to sit that part out and then had, I guess, some reservations as to whether or not I was not allowed to, I had eliminated myself from participating in one of the greatest news stories of our time. But being a Merle Fellow here under Les Gelb, he refocused all of the work that the fellows were doing on 9-11 and, um, and the impact. And so when I was in Indonesia, I had spent a lot of time looking at the rise of radical Islam and what had been the world's largest and most liberal uh, population of Muslims. And so during my year here, I was able to spend that time away from deadlines, looking at whether or not Islam was compatible with democracy, spending some time back in Indonesia without deadlines, meeting with people like Abu Bakar Bashir, the head of the, uh, spirit, the spiritual leader of the head of the group that did the Bali bombings. And I wrote a policy paper here at, um, at the council. When I returned to the Times, uh, we were still looking at this mix between democracy and Islam. And I was able to turn that policy paper here at the, um, from, the, from the Council on Foreign Relations into a documentary that appeared on PBS, which looked at the rise of radical Islam and how it was not going to take over Indonesia. And even though we continue to see bombings there, it is now a viable democracy. So on the personal note, I'm very grateful to the time that I was able to spend here um, at the council, the time that I was able to spend with other fellows and to have 
this open exchange that takes place here between fellows. A journalist rarely has the time to engage in an exchange of openness with uh, fellows from the CIA or from the military, and that's what this place provides. It's a sanctuary for that kind of exchange. So Ford is very pleased to be a sponsor of uh, this fellowship, and I hope that you will help us meet our challenge in making the Merrill Fellowship viable for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Calvin, so much. I'm actually going to sit down and continue to have our mics on. Yes. Great. Uh, so without further ado, let's get on to our topic. And this morning we're talking about the challenges of reporting from closed societies. Uh, last night we heard about some of the dangers of reporting overseas, but there are particular challenges from closed societies. And we're going to talk among ourselves for about a half hour and then open it up to your questions. A reminder to our audience here, I'm sure you need no reminder, to turn off your cell phones and Blackberries and don't just put them on vibrate because it will, it will interfere with the sound system. This meeting is on the record. It's being viewed on a live webcast uh, by members around the country and the world. Uh, now to our panel. We have a stellar cast, really, of four former Murrow Fellows, all with deep experience in reporting from closed societies where I think my definition, our definition would be where the governments see the free flow of information as some sort of a threat and seek to choke it off. And it takes many forms, as we know. Um, and so I'll start over to my left, Dan Sutherland, uh, our oldest Murrow Fellow here from 1991. <laughs> <laughs> that is most seasoned Murrow Fellow. Uh, he is now Vice President and Executive Editor of Radio Free Asia, where he basically runs all their editorial operations throughout Asia, including in two quite closed societies, two at least, China and North Korea. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're doing in Myanmar as well. Uh, he spent years as the Washington Post uh, as a foreign correspondent, particularly as bureau chief in Beijing at the time of the Tiananmen uh, Square uprising in June of 1989. Uh, David Remnick, uh, who followed, I think, Dan Sutherland as a Murrow Fellow in 91-92, is now editor of the New Yorker magazine. He also spent years at the Washington Post with four years as its Moscow correspondent, beginning in 88, uh, covering <coughs> the essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union. And as he likes to say, from uh, as experienced by its peasants as well as its politicians. He wrote an incredible book called Lenin's Tomb, The Last Days of the Soviet Empire, written while he was a Murrow Fellow here, and it won the Pulitzer Prize in 94. Uh, Carol Murphy, who was a Murrow Fellow in 94, 95, is now an independent journalist living and working in Saudi Arabia, another closed society. Uh, until 2006, she too was a longtime correspondent for the uh, Washington Post. I wonder what we're learning here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> serving. Um, <laughs> or <laughs> Washington Post is cutting back on foreign correspondents a lot. <laughs> but uh, in both Southern Africa and then as the paper's Cairo bureau chief, responsible for covering the Arab world. And Carol, as I'm sure most of you remember, was famously in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein's forces invaded that country. And she remained as really uh, ultimately the only Western journalist there, continuing to report uh, really at considerable risk to herself, hiding out in a basement to do so, to hide out from Iraqi troops. And Elizabeth Rubin, who is just departing as our Murrow Fellow. She's a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine. And for uh, she's been working as a foreign correspondent in a lot of these uh, difficult to report from places. I'll name a few, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Russia, and here come the easy ones, the Caucasus, Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans, <laughs> or at least they like to talk. Uh, her stories have also appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, the New Republic, and the New Yorker. So to get a flavor of what it's like reporting from closed societies, I first asked each of our panelists to just give us a brief but, but insi an insightful anecdote about one time in their career where it was really hard to get the true story. And I'm going to start with Elizabeth. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, this was a, a story that took place in Pakistan just after 9-11. It was in January mm -hmm. of 2002. And I don't know if you remember, but Musharraf gave a very um, powerful and persuasive speech that in fact, he was going to be with the United States, and he was going to uh, shut down all the Islamic political parties who were involved in jihad in Kashmir, in Afghanistan, everywhere. 
and he told his, his, uh, the country, you know, to the Pakistanis as well. And so as journalists, it was natural that we were going to go find out if this was true. Um, and Azad Kashmir is the Pakistani part of Kashmir. And the only way you can really go there is with the military. <coughs> um, and they do this funny thing on the paper where it says you have three days there. But what it really means is that you can stay in the hotel for three days and they'll take you out for an one hour <laughs> to the, the front line to see the Indians on the other side with their guns. And they'll take you to one refugee camp where you can speak to one family. So I thought this was kind of absurd and there was no way I was going to get a story. So I tried to persuade them that we wanted to do something on the life of the people there and I was going to need to go out. I said, well, we'll see. Maybe you could do that. So I went to the hotel and I couldn't do that. So I had another fixer um, other than the one that I was appointed. And we went out at night. And we went out, and we knew we were followed, and so we went into a mall, and then we went to the back of the mall and got in a rickshaw, and went up into the mountains and met these jihadis from Kashmir and various other people who were going around recruiting people with the help of the Pakistani intelligence. And in fact, the Pakistani intelligence had been the founder of one of these, these parties. Um, so it was a, you know, exactly what we needed. I think we stayed about five hours. I arrived back at the hotel at midnight, and there's about seven guys in white you know, hats standing outside looking very angry. And um, so they say, you know, how worried they were, where have I been? Uh, you know, and I'm like, how did you know I wasn't here? What are you doing here? <laughs> Who are you? go to your room. So I went to my room. <laughs> and the next day, I was told not to come out of my room. And, uh, and I, so I start calling, you know, the generals and everybody, what's going on? I didn't do anything wrong. And they said, you're under house arrest. You can't leave. And so I stay there. And I'm getting really antsy. I hate being confined. So I said, couldn't I just go out and have a little snack or something in town? Mm -hmm. So we go out to do that. And I kind of go back to the same place. And at which point, that was probably not the smartest thing to do. Um, there's a knock on the door uh, about three or four hours later. And the captain who was in charge of me was there and basically said, you know, to the person who answered the door, if they don't leave within the next ten or half an hour, everyone's going to be arrested. So we left. At which point, the story of my, who I worked for and what I did started to get really big. Um, I worked for the CIA. I had tied the sheets together of my bed and climbed out the third story window. Um, you know, I was clearly a trained militant <laughs> of some kind. <laughs> and this was told to me by the Pakistani general, you know, head of the army himself. And he said, look at me. Do I look like I could jump out of a window? Said, I'm not sure. Maybe. But what ended up happening is quite serious. My translator, who was a, without protection, he was a Kashmiri from India, and very much wanted to do this story because he wanted to get what had happened to him out. He disappeared. Um, all of the people that I spoke to were arrested and put in prison. Um, and I started to get everybody from the embassy to the general to try to find out where this translator was. He'd been stopped on the road and put in a basement and basically tortured for two weeks. And you know, you kind of wonder, was the story, was it worth it? Um, one of the guys was in prison for either six months or a year, just for meeting with him. And this is not the first time you know, that it happened. But in the end, I think it probably is worth it. And a lot of these people knew that they were risking what they were risking. And they'd been risking their lives anyway for everything that they'd done you know, and fought for. But it happens quite often that we you know, rely on people and work with people. And you know, it can seem like right now, some of it's very funny. But it wasn't very funny for all of the people involved in this story. And I often wonder, you know, when, how do you know when it's worth it to risk these people's lives? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an impossible question to answer. But one I hope we'll get to. Dan Sutherland, we, tell us what it was like uh, in the immediate aftermath, well, during and the aftermath of the Tiananmen uprising when the Chinese authorities clamped down in a major way. Well, the, uh, the first part was kind of you know, into horrible, the demonstrations, the protests the leading up to the crackdown. That was, I mean, just, I, I hate to admit it, but it was just kind of very exciting. And, uh, and then all of a sudden the tanks came in. And uh, I, I came up with a brilliant solution for saving my fixers. Uh, I would hire Chinese-speaking Americans 
that he would not be plotted as badly or you know, they wouldn't be arrested. I, I figured I had them out there. Uh, immediately th things began to go wrong. Uh, my guy on Tenement Square was there at 2 a.m. as the tanks moved in and uh, somebody put a gun to his head, knocked him down, started kicking him. Four guys jumped on him, threw him in a jeep-like vehicle, unmarked vehicle, obviously state security people. Uh, some of the civilians on the square and students tried to rush the vehicle. They started firing their pistols outside the vehicle, outside. Uh, he had a hood put over his head, you know, kind of some kind of compound. At one point, he was transferred to something that looked like a barber shop with lots of uh, Chinese coming in and talking about secret meetings, and he could understand Chinese. That's why I chose him. He thought he was going to be shot. Eventually, they drove him to the outskirts of Beijing and dumped him, bruised but not dead. And his last thought on that was, what if I had been a Chinese, how would they have treated me? Uh, I listened to the, the accounts yesterday and just now, I, I really realize I've sort of over the years become obsessed with this issue of the fixers and how to protect mm -hmm. people. And uh, that was certainly my concern at the time. And I in inadvertently got one guy into trouble as uh, this went on. The crackdown came and uh, I, I was trying to get into a hospital to see how many people had died, a hospital not too far from Tiananmen Square. And uh, I get there, and the whole mood in the city had changed from openness to people not talking. S my sources weren't talking. Uh, this doctor comes out of the hospital, and, and there's in the crowd, I don't know what was, who they were, but they started saying, don't let the foreigner in. You know, they knew there were bodies in there. And this guy very bravely stepped up and said, I'll take you in. And we walk into this makeshift morgue, a cement floor, and there are 20 bodies, bullet ridden bodies. They weren't students, by the way. They were, they, were, they were obviously older citizens of Beijing. They weren't young kids, which most of the people who died were not students. They were people who were trying to stop the tanks and so forth. And uh, I, you know, got that information and got out of there. And then I later found out this doctor had been punished for discipline. Uh, and I, I had a brief conversation with him on the phone, but I cut off the conversation because I, th I thought anything I say on this telephone is going to be recorded and we're going to be in more trouble. And it's a, it's a minor example, but it was the kind of thing in China where they normally would not do what they did to you. They're, I think, smarter than that. Uh, but it's still an example of how you live with this all the time. You know, am I going to get this guy into trouble? And I actually bro broke rela uh, relations with my best Chinese friend as a result. There's a, I didn't catch it, but Chinese caught it, and they said, you're being followed there every time you meet this guy. And I'm, I'm, glad, I, I'm glad I did that. I mean, he wasn't giving me high-level information. You know, he was giving me kind of a flavor of what the life is like there. So let's fa fast forward to today. What's happening today? Well, let me we can do that later. <laughs> okay. Let's do that later. Carol, but, uh, uh, just now you, w you were under this challenge of trying to, you stayed in Kuwait, you wanted to report, you even had to seek your stories out, but how did you actually get the information you needed to give a flavor of what life was like? Well, and as the Iraqis I, came in. Yeah, I, I, it was a, an old story, almost 20 years ago, but I think it really highlights how today it's much mm -hmm. harder to have a closed society. Believe it or not, when I was in Kuwait, when Saddam's forces came in, there was no internet to speak of and there were no cell phones to speak of. And none of us today would go out, would n try to do what we do without those tools. Anyway, I initially stayed in the hotel for the first week, and uh, then Iraqi officials were moving in, so I moved in with some American engineers across the street from the hotel in, in their apartment. And I, the second day, uh, the Iraqis cut the telex in the hotel. That's how I filed by telex. I'm sure there are people here <laughs> who don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had no phone, I had no internet, no telex uh, as of the second day. So I was desperately searching for some way to get these, this information out. And I met a guy in an elevator. He was obviously Kuwaiti and I said, I'm a Washington Post reporter, I need a telephone. He said, meet me here tomorrow at this same time and I'll hook you up with someone with a phone. So I went back the next day and he brought with him somebody who was working with the Kuwaiti resistance. And they had stashed in a house on the outer suburbs a satellite telephone that had been smuggled in from Saudi Arabia 
hidden in this empty house. The satellite telephone was almost as big as this. <laughs> it weighed at least 100 pounds. You had to open it up, set up the satellite, then dial the number, but at least it was communication. So he said, look, it's better for you to stay with us and our family so I don't have to keep transporting you back and forth in the city. So I went, uh, I made my second move and I went to stay with this Kuwaiti family. And because they were connected to the resistance, the two main guys leading this faction of the resistance would come and tell me what had been happening that day. One of them was the former top general in the Kuwaiti army, and he's still alive today. The other guy was the head of the police. He had been in Cannes the day of the invasion. He came back to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> really? As one is. <laughs> one reason they were so vulnerable. He, he dressed <laughs> like a Bedouin, and he snuck across <laughs> the border from Saudi to Kuwait. <laughs> and uh, this is a very sad story because he got captured by the Iraqis and has never been heard from since. Um, so I did send, w before I met the Kuwaiti resistance, I did send a story written longhand out with a friend who was leaving, and she faxed it to the Washington Post. Another time, there was a Dutch radio reporter there. She and I went <coughs> to the Swedish embassy and we threw a package <laughs> over the wall <laughs> and said, I mean, we'd call them ahead of time and said, we're going to do this, and asked them to please transmit this information. I think they did, I can't remember now, but I think they did transmit something to the post. But it was the satellite telephone with the Kuwaiti resistance that allowed me to get out my story. And, um, you know, as communications have changed so much, I mean, it's an obvious point that, w you know, closed society. I mean, I'm working in Saudi now, and I'm not the only one. There's, uh, I'm a freelance. There's another woman who's <laughs> freelance. She's American. The AP's just opened a bureau there. Uh, AFP now has an American bureau chief. So I think the Saudis have decided we're going to get a better deal and better, fairer stories if we let them come and stay here and, you know, spend time and meet people. So it's their way of I mean, it's still not easy to get information in Saudi, but it's still very much a closed society. But it's not as closed as it used to be. And it's because they realize, you know, everybody there, especially young people, they're on Facebook, they're Twittering, they, they especially women, use the Internet because they're so restricted in their physical movements. I'll stop there. Just to complete this uh, mosaic, just giving us this, this patchwork flavor, <coughs> David, your experiences in the Soviet Union, now you, when you went there, it was after Gorbachev had famously announced this era of glasnost, but it still must have been a challenge. Well, this is, well, I feel, this is why I feel like an imposter on, on this stage. I, I was sent to a story where the cork was just about out of the bottle so much so that um, I can tell you that one of the earliest stories I did, I was invited to, to KGB headquarters from the Bianco, where very few had been or Above the had prison. been without with the capacity to leave, and uh, <laughs> and I was there to cover the Miss KGB contest. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> I thought. That would get some decent play, <laughs> and so did they, obviously. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I was there from a period from the very beginning of 1988 to literally the flag going down over the Kremlin. It wasn't my fault, <laughs> but this was a period where people. I could have sat on my stoop in front of my, you know, I lived at, we lived in a building that looked like Co-op City in the Bronx, and I could have just answered the mail and interviewed people passing by and gotten a greater picture of Russian life than had been permitted for the previous 70 years, to some degree. I mean, people wanted to speak so much so that at the end of my time in, in early August of, of 1991, I went to interview Alexander Yakovlev, who had been Gorbachev's <laughs> kind of better angel in the Politburo, and I said, uh, you know, what's a uh, really insightful question, what's, what's happening? And he said, well, there will be a KGB-led coup uh, with the participation of the army 
uh, and I you know the uh, kind of revanchist uh, pro-communist side of, of things. And I wrote this down and published it in the newspaper and promptly left the country because my time was up. And as I w turned on the TV and when I finally got back to New York at midnight, there were tanks going by <laughs> my apartment building. So sometimes the story is right in front of your face. That said, and even with the development of Twitter and the internet and email and all the incredible means of communication, a government's capacity to cover up and to lie is still based on the foundation of how many bodies they're willing to fit in a trench. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the Putin government is immensely more clever in the way it, it controls information. It has little safety valves. There's a newspaper here that's kind of free. There's a radio station that's kind of free. But television, of course, which is what everybody watches, is, is completely unfree. And in order to make sure that everybody gets the message, every once in a while there's a body. Not like in 1937, not like in the 50s, just once in a while. And that's enough. And there is the terrible <coughs> conclusion that one draws that the, the amount of truth gathered in a society like that, which is semi this, semi that, is built upon the sheer bravery of people being able to do what these three people have done in their careers, and I have not. So uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, and I mean that really uh, sincerely. Well, what, when you're all reporting from closed societies, particularly if you're living there, being based there, how do you know what the red lines are? And to what degree should <coughs> an American reporter observe those red lines, either to preserve their access or their visa, or or the lives of those who help them. I mean, is this case by case, or I think do you have a ground well, rule? I think in China you get shifting lines, you know, uh, particularly as it as regards the domestic media, the local reporters, <coughs> whom we, you know, who, who have been aggressively pursuing investigative stories but getting blocked. Uh, I think there's a, an element of keeping people uncertain. You know, sometimes you're surprised that you can get somewhere uh, undetected, and other times you get lots of trouble from local officials. So in China, it's partly what's happening in Beijing, where it's going to be more open, and in the countryside, which I feel is not is underreported because it's difficult. The other thing they've done in China is they've outsourced the violence to uh, basically the local officials will have a gang that they work with, who will rough up reporters including some foreign reporters occasionally. That happens in Russia as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, but foreigners yeah. have it easier. <laughs> I, I, no, I, really, I would agree. There are certain, is always I, I would say that there are certain subjects that you could count on one hand that you mm -hmm. would end up in the trench I mentioned for. One of them is Putin's money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything to do with the flow of, of real favors, real money. Money is the subject in Russia. Nobody gives a damn about political gossip and all the stuff that made the Congress crazy in the, in the earlier times. It's all about business secrets, and, it's, it's, um, and the ultimate weapon is greed. Whereas in China, the red lines, at least for the local reporters, are Tiananmen, Tiananmen Taiwan, uh, the three Ts. What's the third? The three Ts, Tibet. Tibet, uh, right. Tibet, absolutely. And I would, I mean, I, I haven't lived in Iran, and it's very hard now for Americans to, to report, I mean, to live in Iran, but, and so you're always worried about the, the extent of your visa, because usually they give you 10 days, and then you try to get it extended. I went and, and did the red line, which was to, to do uh, something about the supreme leader. But I told everybody that's what I was doing. I told all the red line guards that's what I was going to do, and they laughed and thought, no, you should, can't possibly be doing that. And... And actually, it was one of those, again, situations where, you know, my fixer and all the fixers in, in Iran are registered with the Ministry of Culture. So they have to report back everything you're doing. And they'll say to you, if there are people that you want to see that you don't want them to know about, do it with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And um, so that makes things clear. Again, this in this particular instant, my translator, who was an anthropologist and a professor, this was around the time when Hale Esfandiari and Kian Tajbak, you may remember, were arrested, and he disappeared. And um, 
And again, it was a situation we didn't know. Was it because we were working on the Supreme Leader? Why did he disappear? I couldn't get any information. And this went on for eight months. This is a precursor of what's going on now, in a way. Um, in Iran, I would say, it's very hard to know what's going to tip them or tip. I mean, we now we we can see that all of the reformists are on trial now. So that's it's clear what's going on now. But up until this point, we just never knew. Was it because you wrote about women, or because you wrote about sex, or because you wrote about the money? As as you know, David was saying, that is a big deal. <coughs> Talk about the clerics and their money. That's a problem. But um, I would say Iran is one of those places where the red lines are very very unclear. And you know he ended up in uh, what was called white torture, a, a white cell, wearing white clothes. They gave him yogurt and rice, and kept the lights on for 24 hours a day, and you know created a file of thousands and thousands of pages. And at the end, they said "bebaki," which means "sorry, you made a mistake," and you know his life was ruined. And it was not. It, we still don't know. Was it about the supreme leader? Was it that they thought he was involved in this velvet revolution, which the supreme leader is obsessed about? Um, and it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because today, you know, he he sees everybody as being involved in this velvet revolution that was in his imagination to some extent. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I think it's very hard in some places, particularly Iran, to know where that red line is. Now, John Burns of the New York Times, I think, in a speech, was quite critical uh, of some Western reporters in Iraq. Uh, before the Iraq War began, saying that he was critical of CNN. He didn't want. Were so eager to maintain their mm -hmm. access and stature and visa that they did not report on what John Burns felt were right in front of their very eyes the atrocities and oppression of that regime. Is that a is that a tension that exists when you're posted somewhere and you're getting out incredibly revealing and important stories? But you know that if you went over this line or this line, you would be let kicked out. Why report? Why go? It, it, it <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree with John Burns more. And one could easily say that the New Yorker, because I'm, I'm an editor, I, I have the luxury of that, that uh, a newspaper does not. A newspaper has a permanent presence. Increasingly so. There are fewer of them, but the, these permanent presences are, are very important. I'd rather see somebody get chucked out of a country once in a while than to cut these kind of deals, which are, 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 are disgusting. Yeah, because sooner What's or later the they get over it, you know, That's and they right. let your correspondent come back. So I think it is definitely you, what you find out, especially if it's important involving human rights abuses, mm -hmm. you definitely got to report it. You don't have to stay there and report it, but write it outside, but it should be done, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the question that Carol put on the table, though, this now we have this proliferation of social media um, and just communication. And Dan, how, I mean, we saw it famously in Iran where mainstream media began using some of the material coming over this, these new channels, as sources of news. To what degree, for instance, when you're covering Asia, is that part of now your incoming and, and what special, doesn't it present special challenges in terms of understanding, the, assessing the credibility and validity of it? Yeah, I just, uh, just took a look at the cell phone numbers in China. It's 650 million, and they can measure this, 650 million. million. I mean, 82 percent of households have some kind of device. Uh, we're getting, I wouldn't say we're flooded with videos and, uh, and photos, but we're getting a stream, a pretty steady stream from citizen journalists and you look at these videos, and uh, there's a picture, let's say, of some people in a land dispute overturning a police car, and it's kind of shaky. But, you know, you can document what it is, and you know there's a fight going on there, so you can be pr pretty sure it's authentic. And then you see kind of a, a forest of cell phones being held up, taking pictures of all kinds, all angles. And you say, my gosh, I mean, everybody is out there. I was just looking at some film uh, with my wife, a uh, video that my wife did at Tiananmen, and there's a sea of Chinese out in these pictures, obviously, with a million people in the streets. I don't see anybody with a camera. It was too expensive then, yeah. 20 years ago. It's incredible. I mean, everybody, and we're kind of really coping with this by adding web editors to, to evaluate. I mean, one day I was working on a weekend, and, and we had an incident where a couple were filmed sitting on a roof about to commit suicide or something because their house was going to be demolished, or they were threatening. And two reporters are telling me the, the film, the 
video was from different places. I finally managed to get some guy in Hong Kong who said, no, it is this province, you know. I can, I can document it. But it's very tricky because if you get stuck, for example, if the security services try to plant a false video, that, that's a danger. Uh, have you it, had that experience? I haven't that I know of. We've so far not been burned. I think we had one fake picture that we had to deal with. Uh, but that's, that's not bad considering it didn't cause great damage. Uh, the, other, the other tricky thing is what if they go after the person sending this stuff out? And also it's a very short window before the, before the internet police and everybody else catch up with these guys. So I've got a, a, a Hong Kong who just sits there working the phones, you know, trying to get stuff. So it's, uh, it's, but it's very, very hard to deal with. It's not enough. You need good editors to back up, you know, to, to evaluate. And this is why, uh, I guess it took me a couple of decades, but I actually appreciate editors now that I am. <laughs> <laughs> now that you are one. <laughs> are I know the feeling. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, well, I think no correspondent worth his or her salt has has never had the feeling of being in a big country, a big, complicated foreign country, vaguely knowing a language, n not knowing the language at all, depending on a driver, translator, fix, and not feeling like this whole enterprise is vaguely preposterous, which is to say I'm going to understand Afghanistan and write a story or a narrative or show pictures, and this is going to give a deep understanding to the vaguely inattentive American audience <laughs> having a beer at home. So I think it's the height of vanity, and I've been guilty of this vanity. I remember when the first ci citizen journalism just came up and Jim Fowles wrote about it. I was really dismissive of it. First of all, you didn't know technologically what that could mean. You, it, it, it felt also fuzzy and warm and vaguely unrigorous. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there are forms of citizen journalism that are incredibly valuable, and yet, and yet, a lot of cell phone pictures on the streets of Iran give you one thing, and they don't give you a whole lot else. I'm not sure what the world needs more of all the time are more um, uh, images, uh, un unanalyzed, un 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 unsorted through. I, you know, there's there's a lot of that, and there's no special place in heaven, God knows, for editors as such, um, any more than there are for writers as such, but the capacity to also forget this feeling that it's a preposterous uh, enterprise and to learn uh, elements of professionalism and languages and understanding of that culture. And after all, as a reporter, what you are is a bridge mm -hmm. because if you actually have the Afghan write that story, he or she is going to have a hard time communicating in the proper language and the frame of reference and all the rest. So there really is a huge role, you know, for people like this running around, as absurd as it is, and doing something that somebody with a cell phone or a Twitter is not equipped to do. There is something to be said for <coughs> professionalism and learning your craft uh, in about a thousand different ways, just as there is for a doctor. I can fix certain bruises on my <laughs> hands. I cannot give myself heart surgery. Actually knowing something in a craft, there is something to know. It's not just being a seal and balancing a ball on your nose. And we're going to go to questions from the audience. Carol, I just wanted to ask you, you, you said you thought that actually it's getting increasingly difficult for societies or governments to keep their societies closed. Do you think, living now in Saudi Arabia, that the slightly greater openness that the Saudis are showing now has also a blowback to the Saudi audiences, or are they able to keep this kind of wall where you may be writing for American audiences, but they, they read my stories on the web. Mm. So you, know, you think they, it is. Who do you work for? I work for ABCD and they, they go to the website, you know, and watch for my stories. But one thing I also do is I, I send a copy of my story after it's been published to everybody I quoted, including the government. Because, you know, one of the things that I think that you have to get over in many of these societies is that, oh, she's got a hidden agenda. She's not just a journalist. Maybe she's working for some intelligence agency. So the way I fight that is as be as open as possible. And so I always remember to send a copy of the story after it's published to whatever person helped me <coughs> in or out of the government. And I also tell the government sometimes when I think I'm going to do a sensitive story. So I will get 
uh, a warning if I am going to have problems. Like, I decided to do a trip to the eastern province to talk to Shiites and how they're feeling these days. So I just mentioned to the spokesman for the Ministry of Interior that I was planning to do this. I didn't tell mm -hmm. him when I was going. But I said, I'm planning to do this. He didn't say anything. And then when I came back, I went to see him. And I said, well, this is what people are saying. What's your response? And I think that they appreciate the fact that you give them a, an opportunity to comment. Um, so that's how I handle that. Well, we're going to go to um, our members' questions now. So I'm going to invite people to join in the conversation. Um, you all know the, the ground rules, but just please wait for the microphone and then uh, state your name and speak directly into it and your affiliation. And um, of course, please limit yourself to one question and uh, make sure it's a question and not a, a long speech or peroration. <coughs> so who'd like to go first right here? Thank you. Patricia Patterson, Patterson Investment. Um, I can't tell from listening to everybody last night and this morning Many of you are in countries where you're going to be for a while. How many of you learn Arabic, learn Chinese, learn enough to say, let's kill the reporter or at least <laughs> find your way around? That's but how many people <laughs> actually <laughs> learn the language? <laughs> I did, but I only had to go to one place, and it was very large. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people spoke that language, and the Washington Post paid Strangely. good money for me to get a terrible Estonian accent. And, and <laughs> but you know, if you have a job like Olivia's where you're running around all the time, <laughs> um, you know, unless you're you know, Roman Jakobson and <laughs> the, the greatest linguist who ever lived, you, you just can't possibly. I mean, other than Europeans who seem to know lots of languages. Yeah, I would say, and I do, the sort of um, what has been derogatorily referred to as parachuting in, but I do the same. And you go someplace for a month, uh, no, I don't learn well, I can't, Pashto or Dari. Uh, or, um, so that's why the, the translators, fixers, lo we even call, we call them our local producers because they just do, they are absolutely essential as when someone's translating for you, they are your, your filter in a way. And you have really yep. a lot of judgments come into that. Can I just chip in? This is another one of my obsessions, so I'm going to try and make it short. But uh, I have been preaching to journalism school students to learn a difficult language. Get started now. Uh, I started Chinese about, uh, I don't know, several decades ago. I'm still not that good at it. That was rated intermediate recently. Uh, but I still carry little character cards around to study the character. I'm still working on it. I always say the first 20 years are the hardest, then it gets easier. <laughs> Um, I also, uh, I, I partly got this obsession in Vietnam where we were, I was part of the UPI team there, which was covering the American war mostly. And I, you know, somebody realized I spoke French. And at that time it was useful. And they said, Dan, you cover the Vietnamese. So we had about nine guys covering the Americans. Cover the Vietnamese. I had a license to go all over Vietnam and I started studying the language. In fact, I quit UPI just to study the language. So I'm, I can now say, do not shoot in five languages. <laughs> uh, but it really is important. I mean, Seymour Toppy was asking yesterday, what can you tell young reporters when they're going into the field? And I think he was looking for a different answer. But part of it is get the language. It won't help you. It didn't help with the Khmer Rouge. I mean, they just killed every journalist, every fixer, everybody they captured. But it will help you understand the country. And uh, please stop me now because I may. I'll stop you now and just ask <laughs> Carol. So, have you learned Arabic and all these? I words? know a lot of words, <laughs> but I still don't know enough to do an interview in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And the, the main reason is I just never had enough time to sit down, and I didn't have the luxury of the post. The post, in its wisdom, decided that Russian and Spanish and Chinese and Japanese they would teach their correspondents going to those places, but not Arabic. So I didn't get the year-long training. Um, and you know, I wish I had. Uh, but another thing I like to bring up is that w one good thing that's happening is that a lot of young Americans who are interested in journalism, uh, you know, their parents or their grandparents immigrated from these countries, right. and they're learning the language, and they're going to those areas. The second thing that's happening is a lot of young people <coughs> in these countries that we cover that are difficult, they're the, the young people there are more competent now to be journalists in the Western tradition than they were 20 years ago. 
I mean, you can get now people who can write a story for an American audience. It may need a good editor, but in many of these countries, you can get that. And you couldn't get that, you know, 20 or 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, there's a reason you're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of bylines in the Post and the Times and, and mm -hmm. uh, who are, you know, native and or, or, or people who are fixers who are now being mm -hmm. elevated into and getting their due in a sense. For example, in Gaza, the New York Times person in Gaza all the time is uh, Tahrir El Khodari. And, you know, I, it's, it's not impossible to imagine that sometimes her sentence structure might not be absolutely elegant, but they can fix that in the garage. And she knows a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, you know, and when one is getting led around by her, as, as I have, you know, you, you know, you feel like you're a little bit in a marionette uh, kind of relationship because she knows everything. She takes you to the person. She knows the better questions to ask. And you <laughs> then begin to ask yourself, what the hell am I at? <laughs> <laughs> you're well known so it's a kind of honesty in, in advertising. Yes, well. which is good to see. Right here in the third row. Hi, Jim O'Neill from Clarium. I'd like to ask each panelist to give a two-word answer. What two closed societies are most underreported? Well, I'll uh, let Mike come back to that. <laughs> North Korea. Oh, yeah, I'd say North Korea and Myan Myanmar. Burma. Yeah. Actually, Burma. Uh, Burma. My, my radio covers North Korea like crazy. Uh, and uh, we're working, uh, one of the interesting things is we're working with North Korean defectors who are turning them into broadcasters. And boy, I'll tell you, that's quite an experience. Uh -huh. I mean, you meet one of those guys and you realize they're from another planet. Uh, I think there are stories in China that are underreported, but, that we, but not, not the whole thing. Do you have, since this questioner asked for a two-word answer? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, Ms. No, I'm Ted Sorensen and Paul Weiss. Having uh, parachuted in as a lawyer to uh, <laughs> many of these uh, countries and similar uh, countries, I'd like to ask uh, whether any of you uh, had relations with the uh, U.S. Embassy and whether that's helpful, useless, or risky. Oh. Good I can answer that. Yeah. When I started my career as a foreign correspondent, um, that was before I went to the Middle East. I was in um, South Africa. The, the United States Embassy was a wonderful source of information. Um, they had people who uh, would you know, take you in, uh, give you a briefing on the economy and the politics, give you names and phone numbers, have you meet the ambassador. And, then, and they were really a good check on your own reporting. You know. But in the last 10 years, especially under the Bush administration, the, the embassies are like locked boxes. They don't want to give out any information. And, um, you know, it's, it's, and also it varies from country to country. But uh, since the closure of the um, U.S. Information Agency, it's really gotten much more difficult to get cooperation uh, on an information basis. Everybody is afraid to talk. Mm. They're afraid that you're going to misquote them and then their career will suffer or they've been told from Washington, don't talk to journalists. It's really uh, I, I, upsetting. I think it was a little bit where I was, a kind of point of pride that one didn't get one's stories at the embassy, that it was a really considered a low rent thing to be an embassy reporter mm -hmm. and that if you got anything more than Rice Krispies there, you were... It, it, it was a bit of, uh, if I look back on it, uh, silliness, because there were smart people at the Russian embassy. Jack Matlock was actually an exceptional uh, I I ambassador. There were some political people there that knew a lot. But as I say, the Soviet Union at that time went from being a black box. I mean, if you read Rick Smith's book or Bob Posner's book from the 70s, every, every conversation is secret and there's a very tight, you know, group of friends that they could really speak to, and they were all dissidents or semi-dissidents in Moscow, and so on. And all of a sudden, this broke open. So to spend more than five minutes, at the, you know, in the embassy was was not on. But um, I think the the whole Bush bit hadn't happened yet. I mean, to Reagan's credit, the Moscow embassy was not like that. When I go in a foreign country, because I'm going in just for months, I try to go in and see the U.S. ambassador almost immediately just to understand what 
so, sort of what the administration's view, what view they're getting from the field. And I find that useful. It is, doesn't, it's always off the record, it's not a story, but there are some very astute, uh, savvy ambassadors out there. Um, that said, I think part of the problem, especially in areas, I'll give you an example from <coughs> Afghanistan, is most of your embassy people in a danger area aren't getting out at all. I had a um, bizarre experience flying out of Afghanistan. Finally, it was, I was a baggage claim at Dubai. And someone from the embassy, I won't give you his position, but it was fairly high up, and it was someone who'd be very involved in writing the reports about the country, said to me how you know they've seen my pieces and blah, blah, blah. And he, and I, I said, well, what do you think's going on there? And he said, well, I really think that the press has been awfully you know, negative about the prospects for our uh, engagement, and if you get out in the country, it, people will re are really glad that we've got a, we're making a commitment. And I said, oh, how interesting. You know, where were you? Where have you been? He said, well, actually, I've, I've never left the <laughs> compound. <laughs> True story. True story. And a very, very bright man. But, and because of security. So I think it's, it's, it's useful simply for, you know, if you're looking at the political dynamics, they have an important insight, but it's it's not a key to the culture. Of and the may I just add something? It's it's really sad to see U.S. embassies in many countries nowadays because they are like fortresses. Mm -hmm. There's no longer they no longer represent the open society that we do have here, and it's very sad. I mean, interestingly, now a lot of people who've gone to work for the administration, like in Afghanistan or Pakistan, they're working as consultants because it's the only way that they mm. can escape the, right. the confines of the embassy. So they'll say, okay, we'll come and work with you, Holbrook, but we're not gonna be part of that whole uh, you know, security apparatus where we don't leave, because otherwise there's no point in having them. But you do need, particularly since we are at war now, you know, in these countries, you have to go to, to some extent to the U.S. Embassy because you, or to the Americans to find out, like, well, how do they see this? What are they doing here? Why? What is, I mean, I just did this piece about Karzai in Afghanistan, and <coughs> I wanted to know what the interactions are between the embassy and Karzai, and you know, and you, you have to, and sometimes you really have to push, and you have to keep calling them over and over and over again, because that first meeting is useless. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you can't ignore them. And it's true, I think in the 90s, it was kind of like, you didn't go to the US embassy, right. it was kind of embarrassing. You know, <laughs> you got your story elsewhere. But, but you do have to engage with them now. I, I think I, I agree with Carol that it's it varies from embassy to embassy, and I mean, and, and there are experts in government who are worth consulting. And I don't I don't take this attitude that you know you should just blow them off. I think you just have to find out who's smart and pick out you know embassy within the embassy itself. You know, have lunch with somebody. Sometimes that brings out a little more background information. Yeah. But they have they have things to contribute. Yeah. Right here on the aisle. Thank you. Yes, Rory O'Connor from Media Channel. I'd like to go back to uh, Margaret, what you said right at the very beginning here. My question is, are we seeing the, the end of the foreign correspondent with all these ex-Washington Post foreign correspondents on the stage? Or conversely, and I'd address this to Carol, in this day of uh, layoffs and, and buy, buyouts, buybacks, and so on, are we instead seeing a new flowering through the Internet? I, I'd like to, in particular, ask you about your experience with the Global Post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the cutback of foreign correspondence by most American newspapers and television stations is a boon to people who are willing to work as uh, freelancers. You know, where you, you, you have to pay for your own 401k and your own health benefits. Um, if, but especially for young, young people starting out, who you have to find a country where there's still an interest by American editors and there's not that much competition. You know, I didn't go to Beirut or Cairo because there's already scores of young people trying to be foreign correspondents there. So I went to a place where there are fewer. And there's still an interest in news from Saudi Arabia. So, um, yeah, uh, what was this? Oh, Global Post. Global Post, uh, you know, I have a feeling it's going to make it. Uh, it's still an experiment. It just started in January. Um, but I think that the, the, the design and the, the concept might eventually work. You know, they're getting their revenue from three different streams. 
syndication and advertisement and then special access. Um, they don't pay that great, uh, as we heard yesterday, uh, but you know, it's exposure and it's a nice presentation. And uh, I'm not sure it'll be the only way foreign news gets delivered in the future, but it's one way. We do actually have a whole panel coming up next on that with Charlie Sennett from Global Post. But does anyone else have another no, thought in, in general about with all these cutbacks? Just to give you some good news, uh, there are more foreign correspondents in Beijing now than there were when I was there. In other words, it's increased. But they were of a different type, many of them. They're, they're guys who have three, what we call three strings. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're stringing for a lot of people. They don't make a lot of money. Uh, but they're, and they're doing a lot of business reporting, more business reporting. Look at the New York Times in China right now. They seem to have three people in Beijing, one in Shanghai, one in Hong Kong. That's amazing given their financial problems. Washington Post is down to one. Washington Post foreign staff down from 26 to maybe 14. Mm -hmm. So that's very painful for me. And I hate to praise the New York Times because they were the, they were the enemy, you know, the competitors. But, but it actually, there is some good, some good news out there on Sunday. And, and I think that the, the challenge is for for the non-Washington Post and non-New York Times and Wall Street Journal, I mean, they're really just a handful of papers that are now fielding their own foreign correspondents, in, as we heard last night, with a presence. And I think that presents particular challenges um, of consistency and, and quality. And we have to find another way to, to maintain those, th those standards but, but adapt to the new financial realities, which is, of course, what the big challenge is. And I'm glad we didn't have to solve that at this panel. <laughs> uh, another question? Yes, right here. Then I'll take one from the back. I'm sorry. I've been focusing here. Uh, my name is Tony Catalia. I'm with the Oleon Group. Um, I think it's been really interesting, considering last night's panel and this morning, listening to you all about talking about fixers. It seems to me like this is something that's becoming much more of an issue, much more of a story. So my question to you guys, obviously when, when, you know, when we hear about fixers, we, you, know, you have to take into consideration of who they're getting you to meet with. But when you're talking about closed societies in general and the governments in those societies, at what point does the fixer become the story? If something happens to the fixer or if you're trying to find out something and they disap disappear and you, you, you lose track of them? Um, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand your question. You mean, do we have special responsibility, or that they? I mean, they clearly become a story if they get killed. I mean, but usually you're trying not to make. I mean, occasionally I've had fixers in a foreign country that I'll say, God, he's just the perfect character. You get to know this person. You spend two weeks dri driving around with them. All these interesting insights, but it's just a red line you don't cross. You don't make them a, a character. I mean. And you have to be, I think, very aware of each fixer comes from his or her own set of the political assumptions and they're part of a certain strata of society and they have certain cultural assumptions. So you always have to filter for that. I think we have to, to be honest, uh, what we realize about fi fixers, we don't often realize enough about ourselves. Mm. In other words, um, we are very discerning about who a fixer takes us to because we know that that fixer is so-and-so and, -so and his or her connections are with so-and-so. We don't ask those questions about ourselves mm -hmm. enough, what our own orientations are, what our own presumptions and assumptions are. Uh, is the, is the uh, real bandwidth of political opinion in the United States Democrat and Republican and, and all those things that we – that. You know, is a, is a kind of radical critique of American journalism that we confine to this whole area and call it Noam Chomsky or, or, or struct, post structure, whatever. It's a, a, a real serious subject. And I'm glad to see that it gets asked a lot more. As far as fixers are concerned, um, if you can't see through your own fixers' habits or, or presumptions, then you really shouldn't be out doing that job. And my experience with them, which is not as rich as some of you like Elizabeth, is that they are, if you have any decent uh, tendencies for hiring good people, they're extraordinary. And they're brave and they're selfless, almost to an embarrassing, shaming degree. And so if somebody, something, if they, somebody gets hurt or, God forbid, killed or kidnapped and you write a story about it, I, I can't see anything wrong with that in the world. No, oftentimes those stories are unbelievable because they've seen things I mean, for instance, some of the translators in Afghanistan who worked with the special forces, 
they have some things that none of us know about, you know, and yeah. they, uh, one of them who I know ended up in prison accused of being a Taliban and he had been with the special forces and, you know, these people have unbelievable stories to tell. I don't think it's, it's odd to tell their story just because they're a fixer. It doesn't make them any mm -hmm. less, you know, uh, valuable to see what they've seen and to see what they've experienced. But would you fear you might be revealing too much and endangering them if you if you? Oh, I'd only do it if they wanted it. You know, I wouldn't write a story about them if they no, if they didn't want they it. Cannot so want it. They cannot want it. And they usually it. don't. Mm -hmm. And some of them do who maybe left. But no, most of the time you're not going to write. And they don't even want their names in the piece. There was a question back here. Yes, sir. Maury Hellitzer. I was a fellow in 1960-61. My question to the panel and also to members of the audience, uh, can you identify a watershed event when it became risky, life-threatening for foreign correspondents? Because just to give you a, m a little context on it, I was in Yugoslavia in 1949, and that was relatively a closed society. For a closed society, it would not qualify today. Uh, <clears throat> But essentially, there was a sense of immunity. Foreign correspondent, you were safe. I was traveling from Belgrade to, from Dog Zagreb to Belgrade uh, on the train. I had a beard at the time. Conductor looked at the passport, said, uh, Chetnik. These were the Nazi allied <coughs> members in Zagreb in World War II. And then he said, What kind of name? Mr. Brown Brown. I was taken off the train and I was taken to the Ministry of the Interior. And I was quizzed there, so on and so forth, and then somebody came by and found out I was a foreigner and the person who had done it was admonished and I was taken off. But s subsequent to that, it did become life-threatening or at least in danger of being kidnapped or killed. And was there a watershed event that brought this about or was it just a movement in general? Well, Russia was the election of Vladimir Putin and the murder of Paul Klebnikov. And mm -hmm. But they cannot kill foreigners, and mostly, mostly Russians. That's what they care about. They care about that informational mm -hmm. unit. I think it's gotten much more dangerous for foreign correspondents, not necessarily always because of retaliation from the government you're trying to cover, <coughs> but from conflict. Uh, there's so many more millions and millions of small arms out there. Look at Africa, where so many countries with 13-year-olds uh, running around with Kalashnikovs, and the conflicts in the Middle East, they tend, like in Lebanon. I mean, it's very easy to get killed uh, reporting those stories. Another question here? Yes, sir, right in the back on the aisle. Chandrakan Pancholi from Overseas India Weekly. My question is, how do you find these fixers and translators and drivers? And does your bureau give you? Does the U.S. Embassy give you? And how do you find <laughs> out that they are, not, they are not planted ones? How do you find your fixers and drivers and so on? And, and uh, do you get them from the U.S. Embassy? And how do you ensure they're not planted? I will say that some of the best fixers have been found out of desperation, like you are, when the war started in Afghanistan, for example, and a lot of people came from Tajikistan into the non-Taliban area, and we needed translators. And there was a medical student who spoke English. And he's turned into the, one of the New York Times' best reporters in, in, in uh, <coughs> Afghanistan. He was just a guy, who, tall guy, who spoke some English. And oftentimes, you can create a fixer. I mean, somebody you, who right. just has a minimum of English and is a smart person, and you can teach them the job, and they get excited by it. And most of the best fixers in Afghanistan, that's how they started. But and I would say the majority of them tended to be from medical school. That they had yeah. some English. That, that's, that's in right. a system of either a chaos society or a free society. In, 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 <laughs> in, in, in China, the, certainly the China that Dan operated in the Soviet Union and I did, and Iraq and many other places, and te Tehran. Yeah. You have government minds. You don't That's have any right. choice whatsoever. 
we had an office in Moscow staffed by a, it sounds very fancy, but believe me, <laughs> uh, a, a translator who, by the way, didn't speak English, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she had other talents. Uh, a driver who got in an accident three or four times a week and refused to drive very often because he was drunk and, and other such. And they were appointed by a government agency. In the Russian case, it's called the PDK. <laughs> it was di the diplomatic corps. It was a diplomatic corps. It was the KGB thing when they went to, and maids were cleaning people. So th on Friday afternoon, they'd go to some meeting, and they would you know, say what they heard at the office, or yeah. what was David and his wife talking about. And this was an excruciatingly boring meeting <laughs> and in its kind of late mannerist phase. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was serious business for a long, long time. The Chinese had this, and you had to live in particular buildings, and you didn't have a choice. So the breakthrough for us is in 1990, we thought, you know, screw this. We'll, we'll just hire somebody, see, see how the government reacts. We'll hire somebody that's actually good. <laughs> and I hired a woman named Masha Lippmann. Oh, wow. wow. Goodness. And Masha Lippmann had great English, and she knew a lot, and she was smarter than everybody, to do, blah, blah, blah. She's now a columnist for the Washington Post. She was one of the best journalists in, in, in Russia when there was that period when there was actual journalism. And, you know, you She's at an important think tank. Yeah, she's the Carnegie Endowment yeah. there in, in mm -hmm. Moscow. She's real when some of us go to Russia, we put her on the air as an expert. Yeah, she's on, on the tube a lot. <laughs> um, I think, I hate to say it, but I think my time, our time is up. This has been a really fascinating panel, and I thank all my panelists. Thank you. Our next one at 10.15, we'll get more into global post and, and sort of the new forms of re foreign reporting in this digital age. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.